Hello everyone, Lordmaster of Sotek here, and today is going to be a little bit of a short video, but it's essentially going to be me talking about something that I noticed a few people that showed up in my stream yesterday, and also just some comments that I've seen that kind of caught my attention, made me want to address a particular topic that was brought up because of yesterday's video on the Old World article, which is to say that in the Old World article, there is a part of it that talks about and addresses the issue of will this be a alternate timeline? Will this be an alternate universe? Or is this going to be the exact same Warhammer Fantasy universe we all know and love just 200 years earlier? And the article confirms that this is indeed the same timeline. So by that, it means that that Warhammer the Old World, regardless of what happens during the Old World lore, because we know there's going to be retcons. Like, I would be willing to bet a billion, billion dollars that there is going to be retcons to things that have existed prior while they're trying to kind of flesh out and expand on this relatively unknown era in the Warhammer world. But no matter what goes down, eventually this old world will continue on, uh, whether or not the setting follows that, but the timeline would continue on until we reach the quote unquote modern era of Warhammer fantasy, which then leads us into the end times. And one of the things they make clear in the article is that the end times is still going to happen. There's no, this isn't like a situation where it might set up a situation where the end times, it, this isn't like the new Final Fantasy VII, right? Where <laughs> you play through the game and then at the end, it kind of takes a sudden left turn and is like, ah, things are different. Like there's, there's a change to the timeline. We're telling a new story now, which I don't think there would have been anything wrong with that. Um, a lot of people, I think, would have preferred that. I personally would rather the universe do its best to stay one cohesive universe uh, because it makes my brain easier, and I think there's a lot of good things that can be done with that. But I did want to just talk a bit about that. So, first of all, uh, I will say that while it is true that the end times as a whole was pretty bad, it was not super well written and it had a huge amount of errors and it was rushed and it was just a big stinking mess. I do think that it was the ideal way for the setting to end in the sense that chaos ends up destroying the world. And a lot of people will probably raise an eyebrow at that or be like, ah, how can you say that? Because I often talk a lot about in my channel when I talk about lore videos or just rambling uh, on stream or whatever about the Warhammer world, I talk about all these ways that maybe chaos could have been defeated. But one of the primary tenets, one of like the core philosophies of the Warhammer fantasy universe is that chaos inevitably is going to win in Warhammer fantasy. It's something that it's not talked about as much in like seventh and eighth edition because they were more focused on the buildup to starting off the end times. But if you go back into the older editions, it's something that's pretty much always been there. It's always been lurking in the back of Warhammer Fantasy. That when you look at the, um, the like the core rule books and you look at a lot of the more narrative focused uh, blurbs or statements, one of the things they basically always say is that the moment chaos came into the world at the beginning of time, or not the beginning of time, but like fifteen thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago, when when chaos first popped up. Uh, and shattered the polar gates and flooded across the world. At that moment, the world was doomed. Everything that happened afterwards genuinely never had a true chance of defeating chaos. Instead, it was more trying to slow it down or trying to push back the doomsday clock another hour. But there would never really was a good chance of stopping it. You know, the polar vortex, or not the polar vortex, that's ours, uh, the magical vortex, uh, the great vortex on Ulthuan was a delaying tactic. It staunched the, it staunched the flow of blood from the world, right? It, it made magic significantly more scarce to make it where demons could no longer easily manifest, but the northern and southern poles were still completely lost to the realm of chaos. And even after the creation of the Vortex, 
those the realms of chaos continue to expand and contract it's kind of like a living breathing thing it gets bigger when uh, chaos starts to ascend and like a new ever chosen comes up or some mighty new champion or some notable force but there's something that always causes chaos to begin to swell and when that happens it starts to expand uh southwards from you know across the chaos ways and devour more and more territory until inevitably it's defeated and it pulls back but it pulls back a little less each time so like while chaos might make a surge forward of like 20 percent when it loses and it's pushed back by the forces of order it's only pushed back maybe 15 percent so it still had a net gain of five percent and every single time there was a major event or a major chaos invasion or something crazy like that, chaos always made permanent gains and there was no stopping it. There were ways to slow it down. There were ways to delay it. And from the perspective of the various races in Warhammer, many of them either did not know or refused to acknowledge that chaos's win was inevitable. You know, they were, you know, why would they, you know, it, it'd be pointless for them to just give up hope and accept the end. So there were all these different forces and factions that were looking for ways to defeat chaos. But kind of what I wanted to focus on was that the, the end times from like a meta level or like from just a looking from an omnipotent, omnipresent view at the Warhammer world had to happen. It was going to happen. There's no stopping it. Even if the good guys had managed to thwart Archeon that, you know, they Sigmar had actually managed to kill him instead of just throwing him down that pit where he eventually crawled out and they had managed to seal that chaos rift. There is actually kind of a funny quote in Age of Sigmar that very heavily implies that if the incarnates had won, they would have defeated chaos instead of just delaying it, which I'm not exactly sure how that makes a lot of sense because they were really only closing a single chaos portal, which was a new one. Uh, they still would have potentially had the two at the northern and southern poles, but who knows? Maybe, maybe by proving they could work together to defeat chaos, they would have been able to just keep going. But in any event, um, even if they had succeeded, the world was still doomed, pretty much. It, it was still a complete wreck. Like they couldn't see the sun anymore because the atmosphere was completely choked out by the debris from the uh, the Warpstone uh, Morselib being exploded and all of like the debris and dust that was thrown into the atmosphere by parts of it crashing into the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, the, most of the oceans had boiled, even though Lord Croak managed to stop them from boiling away completely, it still likely destroyed all of the sea life that was in there. And, you know, the entirety of Lustria and Nagaroth were gone. Much of the Southlands had been incinerated. Like, the, the world was basically unsalvageable. Even if the good guys had managed to come out on top, you know, it, it would have been a completely different setting. So, basically just, you know, pushing it that little extra bit further to put the poor thing out of its misery and restarting the setting, or not restarting, but continuing the setting on Age of Sigmar was the best decision. Um, in light of how they decided to handle the end times. But... The whole, like, there is an apocalypse coming and it cannot be stopped and chaos is going to destroy the world. That is an inevitable end to fantasy. That's the way it was always meant to be. That even when the elves dealt that severe blow to chaos uh, and the other races, you know, managed to limp out of the great cataclysm, there's always these notes about the world wasn't saved. The apocalypse was simply delayed. And that's all it's ever been. Every ever chosen that was killed, every demon prince that was banished, every greater demon that was struck down, and the forces of chaos cast back was just a delay. There was no stopping it. You know, the chaos is a is a horrible infection on the Warhammer world that there is no cure. There is no stopping it. It is a it is it is the most resilient and nasty form of cancer. And there are ways to give the, the planet like a little hit of life to slow, maybe slow the spread of the cancer a little bit, maybe ways to uh, restore or heal things that have been wounded. But the core issue, the, the, that, that main 
problem being the true realm of chaos itself and the dark gods are an insurmountable foe uh, from that kind of meta looking from the gods point of view. Now, I don't, I think it's a lot of fun to explore what if scenarios. And I think that there are potential what if scenarios where the good guys could win or well, I say good guys, but where the forces of order or even the forces of death or destruction might come out on top. Um, but it's, it's something that it, it's ultimately a what if scenario. It wouldn't really, it, it would never have panned out that way, even though it is super fun to explore. You know, Warhammer Fantasy, although it is not nearly as grimdark as Warhammer 40,000, it is still has its origins as a grimdark universe. I do think that the later editions introduce significantly more hope and they introduce significantly more powerful characters and they introduce mechanisms and prophecies and ways by which chaos could theoretically be defeated. But the heart of Warhammer Fantasy still had that grim darkness to it and that while yes, there were potential ways chaos could have been eternally thwarted, there are potential ways the dark gods themselves might have been killed. Ultimately, it, for it to be Warhammer Fantasy, it has to end the way it did. Though, obviously, it could have been better written. Like, I would be... Some people probably would hate this, but I personally would love, 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 love it if Games Workshop would just take another shot at the end times someday in the distant future. Uh, not now, not anytime soon. I think the end times is still a little too fresh for many people, even though it's been like a decade. But, you know, I would love if maybe 20 years after the end times uh, in our world, you know, maybe they take another shot at it. But with significantly more planning <laughs> and preparation and actually like, okay, what all the prophecies do we need to resolve? Who are all the major characters? You know, who are all the characters? You know, we want to make sure the major characters have major involvement and the minor characters have at least some involvement. You know, make sure every single playable race gets a time in the sunshine. You know, the, the end times, I don't think the end times was horrible because it happened. I think the end times was horrible because of the way it happened. Uh, but I know a lot of people probably don't agree with that. Um, you know, I, ideally, I would have liked Warhammer Fantasy to have continued on forever. Granted, I really, really love Age of Sigmar. I'm so happy we have Age of Sigmar. Um, it is something that is very, very different, and I'm excited for where it's going and how it continues to live, uh, you know, following its own quest into the into the horizon while Warhammer is now essentially going through the horse heresy treatment. Uh, I'm I'm really, really happy in the situation we have ended up in, uh, especially because as much as I loved the modern setting of Warhammer, the fact that we have a canonical death like we we have the end of the story. Um, even if I would prefer the, the ending to be cleaned up, we still know that in the end, the world dies, period. In the end, everybody dies, period, uh, essentially. You know, that provides a lot of strength because as much as I love a lot of Games Workshop's writing, I also dislike a lot of their writing because in my opinion, Games Workshop and Black Library tend to be big wimps when it comes to telling a good story because they're too scared to commit to anything that is an end. You know, they're always trying to perpetuate what's going on. They're always wanting to keep the timeline in almost the exact same place, but also trying to explore it at the same time, which are competing ends, and they lead to really frustrating scenarios where you get like a supplement or a campaign or a, or a book that is feels like it's building up to tell an interesting story. And then at the end of the story, you realize literally nothing happened. Like the only characters that suffered any consequences or any punishments were characters who are not well known, or they only exist within that book because they're disposable. But the main characters, like the character who you picked up that book to learn about the character who you want to see how their story goes, their story usually doesn't go anywhere because it's they, they don't want to risk something happening to that character because what if it's somebody's favorite character and they get mad or, oh, if we kill off this character, can we still sell their model or their mini or whatever, like, you know, that kind of stuff. I personally find it much more compelling when there is a threat, when there is a risk. Um, and 
They can do that now in Warhammer Fantasy for the entirety of the timeline because we know when everything ends. We know where like a lot of things end up. So they have so much more freedom to explore these stories and to really get in there, get their hands dirty and tell like truly compelling uh, tales where characters do die, where characters do fail, where we get to see like their ultimate flaws and we get to see them fighting against the inevitable where is there really any chance of victory? No, not in like the grand scheme, but there are chances for a lot of minor victories, which I still think are really important. You know, just because the end times was overall uh, poorly written and overall uh, kind of had a weird ending that definitely could have been written a lot better. Does that take away from me personally? Some of the like absolutely fantastic scenes, like pretty much the entirety of the Carrick A Peak saga minus the ending uh, with Skarsnick was kind of dumb, but like the whole, like the battles between Queek and Belagar, freaking incredible. The massive like four way battle between Skarsnick, Queek, Belagar, and Goldfag Maneater, incredible. The final showdown between Queek and Belagar or Queek and Thorgrim, amazing. Uh, the duel between Grimgor Ironhide and Archeon, I loved it. Uh, like the big showdowns between, th there were so many characters, like Nagash going up against Setra, that was amazing. I had a ball with that. Or when Setra finally managed to catch Archon the Black and he kills him, great. Uh, Krell versus Sigvald, amazing. Uh, you know, Krokar versus Lord Skrull, 10 out of 10. But so there, there's just all these things that, I think the Warhammer fantasy world in a weird way, because we have the end times, because we know kind of like, you know, the grand scheme of how things are going to play out. We have so much more strength in the ability of storytelling. Like one of the things I'm really excited for with the old world is seeing the characters who I know don't survive the great war against chaos because they're going to be able to do some awesome awesome storytelling if they play their cards right like i am so excited to meet and really get to know high king Alrickson of the kozalid empire the dwarfs right and i'm really excited to see what is, what is young thorgrim like what is thorgrim like before he became high king and what's his journey going to be uh dealing with you know the fact that he has to become king you know are we going to get to explore the the crisis of when high king Alrickson dies and he's stubbornly clinging on to life despite the fact that he's basically a living corpse because he refuses to die until an heir has been selected and they have that year-long trial where it's Ungrim and uh, Belagar's father and uh, Thorgrim and all these princes go out to, uh, you know, do things to prove that they're worthy to be king and Thorgrim ends up winning it. Like, I'm super excited to see that. Are we going to get to see when the Norskin dwarves reconnect with the, uh, the Karaz, uh, the Karaz, uh, oh my gosh, the Karaz Ankor dwarves, uh, at the B Battle of the Gates of Kislev? Like, how are they going to handle that situation? Because Norskin dwarves almost assuredly are going to appear, uh, because they, they're getting much more prominence, uh, in the Cubicle 7, and they likely, they have a very major role to play. Like, are we going to get to see one of the big tragedies I'm so excited for is to see the Norskin Dwarves, actually they march out to help at the Battle of the Gates of Kislev, but while they're doing that, one of uh, Azvar Kul's lieutenants, Valmir Eisling, ends up attacking Krakadrak, and he destroys Krakadrak. Like, he gets into this huge fight with the Dwarves in the Vale, uh, like the, the, the valley around, and the Dwarves realize they're completely screwed. So what they end up doing is they end up setting off like a bunch of charges and detonations and firing their war machines at the mountainside, to collapse the mountains on top of uh, Isling's army, which destroys most of his army, but it also buries what survives in the depths with the dwarves. And um, Valmir Isling's army ends up wiping out the hold. But the Norskin dwarves escape, uh, or many of them escape, and they end up setting up their new capital at uh, Krakad Ravensvak uh, instead of. And then, like you know, Krakad uh, being reclaimed is something that's going on in the modern setting thanks to the updated lore we have from Cuticle 7, which is fascinating. And like, I can't, I, I really hope we get to see that last stand of uh, the, the capital of the Norskin, uh, the uh, Norskin Dwarf Empire and how it falls, because that's going to be gut-wrenching, but also so badass and like such a dwarf thing. You know, I can't wait to see uh, the three 
high elf arc mages uh from Safari, you know, Teclas, uh, I think it's Teclas, Finrir, and Yurtle. Uh, you know, they all show up to help fight the uh alongside the Empire, and they're the only three the elves send, but they're really powerful and they're trying to like teach the human wizards how to use magic. You know, they're estab they're trying to figure out how to break magic down in a way that humans can handle it without becoming corrupted. And that's when they end up meeting the guys who end up becoming the first eight patriarchs of the colleges of magic. And while they're teaching them that, you know, they go to fight and in the midst of the big epic final battle at the battle of the gates of Kislev, one of them dies. You know, one of these, one of these three elves that was almost godlike from a human perspective is actually killed in the fighting. And like, I can't wait to see how he dies and did he go out making, like, presumably he went out making some great sacrifice to save a bunch of humans and dwarves, which, you know, he's an elf. Most high elves are super obnoxious and, you know, holier than thou and would never lower themselves to dying for a lesser race. But we see a high elf here who's going to embody the absolute best of the high elves. You know, he's going to embody the best element of them. And sorry, I've gotten so off topic, but I just want to say that, like, I've seen some people kind of raise their noses at the whole comment that they made about it's the same timeline. You know, the world is still ultimately doomed. Chaos is victory is inevitable. And that that's just that just is Warhammer fantasy. I don't think it's a part that really bears focusing on because I'm much more interested in focusing on how it that fate could be avoided. But for it, it is inevitable. You know, it is true that chaos will win in the end. But just like I was talking with those other characters, the struggles in spite of that inevitability, I find so inspiring and so heartwarming and heartbreaking in equal measure. There's like a bitter sweetness to it. And it also like, although I know not everyone in this channel by any means cares for Age of Sigmar, it also does continue to add more context to Age of Sigmar because everything that happens in Warhammer Fantasy matters in Age of Sigmar because Age of Sigmar is the 40k to Warhammer Fantasies or to uh, 40k's oh my god I messed that up Age of Sigmar is the 40k to uh, the Warhammer Fantasy being Horse Heresy you know so everything that happens in Warhammer Fantasy even if the thread is near so thin it's impossible to see ties into what's going on in Age of Sigmar into how the Age of Sigmar universe was founded, what the gods of Age of Sigmar experienced, because they're not regular gods who were like created by people uh, worshiping strange ideas or emotions or whatever. They're gods in that they were all mortals or, you know, people uh, and stuff like that, with the exception of the Dwarf Ants. Well, the Dwarf Ants' gods are actually a bit tricky, but like they were living, breathing creatures that ascended to godhood. So they have all the trauma and nightmares and failings of their mortal selves, but they are trying to pretend they don't have those problems now that they are gods. And the struggle of them dealing with the fact that they have all that baggage makes them so interesting. And they're so fun to read about. And I always love when like a fantasy character pops up in Age of Sigmar, or when we see a nod to a fantasy character who isn't going to be returning but they, there's still something about them that lingers in the Age of Sigmar universe, whether they appear as a shade in Shaiish or they've been embodied by a godly entity that created something in their honor, like how the Bad Moon has a terrifying erratic um, comet hurtling around it that's actually the essence of Skarsnik because Gorka Morka was so pleased with Skarsnik for ultimately winning the war uh, in Karak Eight Peaks that... Even even the mighty Skaven at the absolute height of their power could not beat this damn little goblin. They had to bribe him to get him to leave. You know, all this stuff is just, it's its so interesting to me. So i that's just kind of what I wanted to ramble about today. Uh, because I'm doing my best to get out daily content, it's, it's going to be kind of a mix of like, sometimes it'll be a lore video, sometimes it'll just be me rambling about random shit, sometimes it's going to be prediction videos, or news videos, or top fives, or whatever like that. So hopefully this was at least interesting to listen to. Uh, let me know if this is the kind of, if this content y'all are like, oh yeah, this was fun to listen to. I'm totally cool with this. Or if you're like, no, this is a waste of time. I'd rather you not release something like this and focus on like less stuff, but it's more like focused. In any event, I uh, hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you next time.